What's up? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, as you can see, the title of our uh, session today is Vital Chemicals and Latin Disease. And our own Dr. Paul Bernstein will be giving that for us today. Um, I'm not even going to try to give a synopsis on this topic. I wouldn't really do any justice, so I'll do the projector. Okay. What's that? Turn off my phone so that way. Okay, um, thank you very much. It's uh, nice to give kind of an overview of some of my uh, long term interests in terms of uh, treatment and biochemistry of retinal diseases. And we're going to be focusing today on phytochemicals in Just where'd that drop out? Okay. So phytochemicals are plant-derived natural products. And as some of you may know who's ever been to my house, that I have a long-term interest in plants, specifically exotic trees. And shown here are just a few uh, examples of some of the trees. These are not the actual trees, but are the... Uh, web versions of these are some of the rarer trees that I have in my collection at home. I have somewhere over 50 different rare trees on a very relatively small plot of land. And the, the rarest tree I have, or the, the most uncommon tree of all that I have is called a Wolimi pine, which is shown here, which was only discovered in Australia in 1993. They do grow over 100 feet tall. And I have uh, a very nice specimen, although it's not nearly as big as this one, a small specimen here. Um, there are, this is a Cryptomoria japonica, which is uh, a Japanese tree. This is found in the Imperial Gardens, if you ever go to Japan. Uh, this one I particularly like, called the Blue Ice Arizona Cypress. It's got a very, it's kind of scaly needles, and it kind of, uh, and, but is, uh, again, it grows, it's very hardy for this type of climate here. And then the, mo the rarest tree I have of all is called a Chihuahua Spruce, which looks just like a blue spruce, but it's found in only a very, remote part of Mexico, and I bought this from, a, from an unusual source online, but I was able to get this one here. Its main claim to fame is it looks like a blue spruce, but it's much, much spikier, so deer won't eat it, is the big thing on this. And as far as I know, I have the only specimen of, of this in, the, in all of Utah. In fact, I've only seen it one other time anywhere in the United States, once in San Diego. So anyway, but this, uh, to put this in perspective, my tree collecting passion is one reason why I'm even here today. When I put this down, when I put, put down on my college and my medical school applications that I was a tree collector, that caught the interviewer's eyes. Every time I would ever had an interview, I could spend half the time on the interview talking about that rather than science, but I think it definitely distinguished me when I was applying to, all, uh, to medical school. So anyway, there is certainly a long history of uh, plant-derived chemicals that are important in the eye. And we don't have time to go through the whole big ocular disease talk, but clearly there are a number of uh, compounds that we use commonly every day that are plant-derived, things such as pilocarpine and atropine to dilate pupils uh, come from the pharmacopoeia going back hundreds of years. Uh, cyclosporin A, although is derived from uh, a fungus, and that's uh, something we use for dry eye. And, um, but we're going to be focusing today on retina, which certainly has a long history of phytochemical disease, of phytochemicals. So, and there are multiple, uh, there are multiple conditions where they may play an important role in the, in the eye, and these include night blindness, retinal degenerations, macular dystrophies, nutritional maculopathies, and age-related macular degeneration. So phytochemicals have been known for a long, long time, going back as far as uh, some of the ancient papyri of, of Egypt, where it was known that, uh, vitamin a, uh, that vitamin A type compounds, either liver or other plant-derived compounds that were somehow rich in vitamin A, was known to the ancient Egyptians to uh, be good for treating night blindness. And vitamin A deficiency is certainly a common disease in the developing world. It's rare here in this world. In, this, uh, in the developed world. And although we have seen a few patients with this with associated with malabsorption syndromes. The night blindness typically uh, pre precedes the ocular surface disease 
and it has to do with the fact that, that retinoid A compounds are key for the visual cycle that we see in the eye. And this was uh, related to some of the work that I did my PhD on of the isomerization of all trans retinoids to 11 cis retinoids is the key step in the visual cycle that occurs in the retinal pigment epithelium. And without enough vitamin A to drive this, pro this process, we develop night blindness. And eventually you can get an unusual form of, uh, of retinopathy. And shown here as, a, as an example of the kind of thing you may see in extreme uh, vitamin A deficiency where you get yellowish white dots in the periphery. And this kind of patient would, be, would have very narrow visual fields, almost an RP type uh, syndrome of night blindness and very nar uh, narrow fields. And if you can just re recharge the vitamin A cycle, you will see uh, a good response in these patients. Um, phytochemicals, because of this, phytochemicals have been looked at for retinal degenerations. And retinitis pigmentosa, which is shown here, uh, has been related to some defects in these visual fields uh, in the uh, visual cycle. And so it was. Uh, proposed by Burson about uh, 20 years ago that vitamin A supplementation might be helpful in some uh, RP patients. And he conducted some large-scale uh, large scale clinical trials where he used vitamin A supplementation at a relatively high dose, 15,000 units per day, in the retinal palmitate form. And he did show that there was a small but subtle uh, decrease in the progression of retinitis pigmentosa. Now, this is kind of, a, we now know that retinitis pigmentosa is really a group of 30, uh, at least 30 different mutations. So it's really many, many different diseases going on. So it's not obvious that vitamin A should really make a difference. But it still is part of clinical practice in many retinal specialties to, do, to give vitamin A supplementation. And I offer it to my patients, but I also offer, tell them that they have to be, they have very modest, modest expect expectations for any response to this uh, supplement because it's just a decrease in the progression of the loss of the cone, uh, cone ERG. So, and you also have to be careful, of course, because vitamin A has its own toxicities. It can, uh, it's teratogenic in uh, women of childbearing age, at least at this dose. And it's also potentially can cause uh, liver function uh, abnormalities in these patients. He's also done further phytochemical studies uh, in the last uh, decade or so. He's also looked at omega-3 fatty acid supplementation, which uh, also seemed to help, but the effect was even weaker. And within the past year, he also looked at lutein supplementation. We'll be covering carotenoids in much more detail later on in this talk. And that was also a very weak it did, uh, effect. It did not reach its primary endpoint. It was only on subsequent analysis that they found some decrease in progression of loss of visual field in the periphery in these pa in the far peri mid periphery in these patients, and based on some work that we did earlier on, where we measured about 10 years ago, where we measured lutein levels, the macular pigment levels in the eye in RP patients, we found that there is no, that they don't have any abnormalities. They're actually normal to high, so it's not obvious that this was really even a great great way to approach RP. And of course, phytochemicals can make some forms of retinitis pigmentosa worse. Disease is a very uncommon disease, but that has to do, it's a, it gives you a retinal degeneration, and that has to do with an inability to metabolize phytanic acid, which is an unusual branched chain fatty acid, saturated fatty acid here. And patients who, have, who are diagnosed with Refsum disease need to have a diet low in phytol, the precursor phytol and phytanic acid which means no green leafy vegetables, no animal fats, and no milk products. So what's left, it's pretty much just cereals. So it's a pretty, pretty nasty uh, disease to have in terms of treatment. And then the other one that famously shows up on boards and on questions is gyrate atrophy. Again, both of these are so rare that I've never actually seen a patient with either of these. But that's a defect in ornithine metabolism, a, uh, an amino acid here that's uncommonly in the diet. And that's treated with a low protein, low arginine diet. Um, phytochemicals also can play a role in macular dystrophies and that we most commonly see as Stargardt disease, which uh, you know, affects about one, to about one 25,000 people are affected in the United States. Forms, the uh, Stargardt 
disease, which accounts for about 95% of the cases, and is caused by a defect in the ABCA4 gene. And the dominant form, which is much less common, but we have a very uh, interesting family here in Utah with this disease that accounts, uh, that's caused by a defect in the ELOVL4 gene. And both of these have nutritional interventions that potentially can be important for them. Um, for Stargardt-1, Stargardt-1 is a defect in the ABCA4 protein, which transports excess vitamin A aldehyde out of the photoreceptor segments as part of the visual cycle. Now, we talked about the importance of vitamin A in, vi in uh, normal vision, but it, too much of it can cause a lot of problems. And it, if it sticks around too long in the, in the uh, photoreceptors before it goes to the RPE to be re-isomerized, it can start having reactions with the phosphatidyl ethanolamine and create a toxic compound here called A2E, which is here. And there are also a lot of other bisretinoids that uh, can form with these reactive aldehydes, the vitamin A. And these, are, these generate free radicals. They also seem to disrupt a lot of enzymatic processes in the eye. And they're very, very indigestible. And they're part of the lipofusin that is a component of malfunction of the RPE. So the thought with Stargardt-1 is that it may actually be good to restrict the vitamin A in, the, in these patients. And so there are interventions of various medications or even dietary interventions that we recommend for the patients that, to try to keep down the levels of vitamin A to decrease the formation of this A2E. And those are still in progress, but there are some clinical trials that will be occurring in the foreseeable future. Stargardt-3 is another one that we think may be very important and have nutritional interventions. Stargardt-3 is a defect in the ELOVL4 gene, which is involved in the very complicated pathways of synthesis of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids in the eye. And in, uh, in animals and in humans that have the ELOVL4 defect, they don't make enough of a lot of the omega-3 and omega-6s, perhaps EPA and DHA, and not shown here, they definitely do not make some of the very long-chain fatty acids that are metabolites of EPA and DHA going on to the C30, uh, up to C36. So the thought with this is that somehow you need to get more of these very long-chain fatty acids into patients. And so we have a clinical trial right now on our patients, on our family with ELOVL4 mutations, to give them, to encourage them to consume more fish and EPA and DHA, either through algae sources or through, um, or through fish consumption to see if we can slow down the progression of the disease. This is an open label, small trial. There's not enough people to ever do a randomized trial on this. But this is in progress, and for the residents who are uh, with me, occasionally you'll see these patients coming through. And of course, if phytochemicals can be helpful in some patients, they can also make things worse. Um, shown here are a couple of classic examples. Canthaxanthin, which is a carotenoid used for skin tanning, can, uh, can crystallize in the eye, and uh, although I don't know why this keeps dropping out, but it does. Um, although visual loss is rare. Okay. Okay. You got it? Okay. Okay. All right. So um, canthaxanthin is uh, has been described well described in the literature. You get this golden crystal retinopathy that occurs in the eye, and so canthaxanthin is certainly not recommended in high doses. It's still in our food supply as a food colorant, and it's still available on the internet actually at pretty high doses. Although I haven't seen anyone coming in looking like this. Other ones that are of con other phytochemicals that are of concern to the retina include things like oxalic acid which can crystallize in the retina, and nicotinic acid, which can cause cystoid macular edema at high doses. And that's still commonly used to treat high cholesterol. But enough of that, we're going to be focusing on age-related macular degeneration, and, uh, which is certainly the focus of a lot of my clinical practice, and where phytochemicals definitely uh, can play an important role. 
And as we all know, age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause, or up until recently at least, I'm not sure it's still true anymore, is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss in developed countries. Um, somewhere between 1.7 and 20 million Americans have age-related macular degeneration, depending on how you define it. And there are about 200,000 200, new advanced cases every year. It's a disease that uh, increases, whose prevalence increases dramatically with age, and it comes in both the wet and the dry form. Uh, the wet form accounts for a smaller portion of AMD, but that's certainly been the focus of a lot of our treatment. Um, and up until the, day, the days that we started getting anti-VEGF compounds, it accounted for about 90% of the blindness. And clearly, it's an important public health problem. The, uh, the rate, especially in whites, rises dramatically as we, uh, as we age. We probably will never completely eliminate age-related macular degeneration, but just if we can delay it somewhat and move the curve to the right more, we can, we can improve quality of life for many, many of our patients, and that's why prevention is important. And just shown here are some classic pictures of age-related macular degeneration, both in the wet form and in the dry form that, in the end, end up in a common pathway with severe scarring and loss of central vision. We've uh, developed great new treatments for age-related macular degeneration. And in my time here on the faculty, it's gone from a disease where we really had no options for the patients. We would tell them, you've lost vision, maybe we can do some laser, and you'd probably even get worse, but in the long term, you're better off, to a disease that's, that's certainly manageable. We do lots and lots of injections into the eye. We now have a very different type of patients. We have happy AMD patients who are at least seeing better. They're not happy about coming in perhaps monthly for Lucentis injections, but at least their vision is much better. And uh, they, don't have, they don't have to deal with the horrible natural history of this. Um, but with all of these treatments, they're expensive. They're a burden to both the doctors and to the patients. So prevention is important. So if you're going to prevent a disease, you have to look at, um, at what are the various risk factors for this and how can we modify them. Certainly there is a, a large a group of non-modifiable risk factors. These include age, which of course is a, an important risk factor. We've learned over the last decade that heredity is a very, very important risk factor, probably accounting for well over, ha well over half of the risk of even getting age-related age macular degeneration. Gender is a more minor risk factor. It seems to be more prevalent in women, but there's also many more elderly women that we're seeing. And it does seem to be more common in lightly pigmented people, so in lightly pigmented races. But, for the, but these are not particularly modifiable. We really have to focus on the modifiable risk factors. We know that smoking is very, very important as a risk factor. That's shown up in multiple epidemiology studies and, needs, and always needs to be addressed with any of our patients who are smokers. It appears to go with cardiovascular risk factors, blood lipid status, and hypertension. So those need to be treated. It's a little more controversial about alcohol consumption, but it appears to be at least low, low alcohol consumption, just like it is for cardiovascular disease, may be protective in some, in some patients. Light exposure at high levels probably is a risk factor, although it's controversial at the more normal ambient uh, uh, light levels that we're exposed to. But we'll be focusing tr today on nutrition. And so why should this be important? Well, the retina and the retinal pigment epithelium have very highly unsaturated lipids, and these are susceptible to oxidative damage. And, this is a, and the macula itself is an area that's exposed to high, high levels of oxygen and high levels of light almost by definition. So if we accept the premise that age-related macular degeneration is at least in part a disease of oxidative stress, it makes sense that antioxidant nutrients, which are the most common antioxidants we deal with naturally, might play a role in protection against age-related macular degeneration. But as we'll see, these are difficult studies to perform. Age-related macular degeneration is a complex disease. Nutrition is a complex factor putting into this. Plus, we have all the other factors that, have, that are involved in progression of age-related macular degeneration. On the other hand, nutrition is something that everyone can participate in. It's not expensive, and it's something that, uh, that most patients with encouragement can modify. So to identify nutritional factors that might be associated with age-related macular degeneration, they have to, there are many different ways we can study this. The classic way that's been done probably for the last few decades is epidemiology, looking at large populations, 
looking at who gets age-related macular degeneration and who doesn't, and who gets, um, and what, are, what kind of nutrients have they been, uh, been consuming or other, risk other environmental risk factors like, like smoking. And from that, they can derive at least good hypotheses of what needs to be tested in a more prospective manner. These will not give you cause and effect, but at least they can give you a lot of information. Animal studies are a little more difficult because animals uh, don't get the same type of macular, don't get macular degeneration, they don't have maculas, and they may even uh, metabolize differently from what we, what we do. Just because we absorb a, a metabolite very, very well doesn't mean it's gonna work the same in an animal model like a mouse. And this is particularly true, say, for carotenoids, my area of, of research. We, as humans, take up carotenoids very readily from the diet and deposit it in our tissues. In mice, you can give massive doses, many, much more than I would even administer to a human, and they just don't even pick it up. They just, uh, they, their body doesn't absorb it, they don't deposit it in their eye. So you can't look at, right now, you can't look at mouse models of retinal disease and really, and just try to feed them carotenoids and, see, and hope that you're gonna learn a lot about the human condition. Um, my laboratory across the way is dedicated to physiology and biochemistry of trying to understand these nutritional factors. And among some of the key things that you want to see are that nutrients should be found in appropriate quantities of the retina, in the retina. So we work with autopsy eyes and we actually measure various nutrients in the eye. If you're going to say a nutrient's important, you better be able to see it in the eye. Uh, otherwise, it's probably not all that relevant. They should have physiologically plausible mechanisms. So if you say something's working well as an antioxidant or a light screening compound, you should be able to show that in vitro. And finally, there should be some evidence that deficiency states might be associated with higher risk of age-related macular degeneration. And eventually, you have to do some sort of prospective trials. And I'll cover some of this. Obviously, this is way too much to cover in uh, just one talk, but we'll talk about some of our perspectives of what we've been finding on the physiology and biochemistry of some of these compounds. So there is a rich epidemiology literature and over the years, a number of nutrients have been epi epidemiologically linked to decreased age-related macular degeneration, degeneration risk. And these range from antioxidant minerals, such as zinc and selenium. And some of the original zinc studies were done by our former faculty member, Mano Swartz, about 20 years ago here at, at, at the University of Utah. And these uh, antioxidant minerals are cofactors for some of the anti antioxidant enzymes in the eye. And it's, it was thought, found that taking high doses of this, at least epidemiologically and in small clinical trials, seemed to be pr protective, and this has been tested in further trials. Antioxidant vitamins, such as vitamins C, E, and A, are good antioxidants that have been tried in a number of trials and are certainly linked epidemiologically. Polyunsaturated fats, like DHA, EPA, and their precursors, um, have been shown to be important, and that's being part tested now in the ARIDS-2 study. Um, I'll be covering today the, my area of primary interest, which is lutein and zeaxanthin, the, car the carotenoids that make up the macular pigment. And to a lesser extent, other carotenoids have also been linked epidemiologically, such as beta carotene and lycopene, which is beta carotene is found in carrots. Lutein and zeaxanthin are found in green and yellow fruits and vegetables, and lycopene, which is found in tomatoes. Um, some of these beta carotene and lycopene are not nearly as strong and they don't fulfill one of the main criteria of being found in large amounts in the eye. Almost none is found in the eye. So they're not, they haven't been an area of focus quite as much. And then there are herbals, which many of our patients talk about all the time. Things like bilberry, uh, resveratrol, other things like that. And I'll touch upon these towards the end. There's obviously not nearly as much information on them. So our current treatments for age-related macular degeneration and prevention is based on the age-related eye disease study, the first one that was done. And they used uh, the, the nutritional knowledge of the 1980s, basically, to come up with a, uh, a supplementation regimen that they tested on nearly 5,000 subjects uh, ranging in the age, certainly in the a AMD age, and followed them for five years. So this is a good, high-quality study that was sufficiently powered and they were randomized to antioxidant supplementation, but they didn't know anything about lutein and zeaxanthin, which we'll talk about later, so those weren't part of it. And they looked at the incidence of cataracts, severe vision loss, and age-related macular degeneration progression. And they had to, because it was a, a clinical trial, they had to 
certainly grade all of the patients to put them into the right categories. And they had categories one through four, which are shown here. Um, and they found fairly early on that they really shouldn't be looking at grades one and grade two. These are essentially the worried well that we deal with uh, in our clinic. They have maybe a few drusen or a few small drusen or some pigmentary abnormalities. But natural hi history of these patients is so slow. I mean, the risk of developing age-related macular degeneration in five years is 1% or less probably in this sort of ca uh, category. So it's not worth studying these patients. You really want to look at the higher risk ones in a clinical trial like the AREDS, AREDS 1 study. So they either had to have extensive intermediate drusen or large drusen or non-central atrophy, but still had good acuity, something that could be uh, where you could follow these patients. Or they had to have um, no advance, or they could have advanced age-related macular degeneration in the fellow eye and, uh, and, a, and certain visual, but good visual acuity and milder AMD in the good eye. The AREDS formulation was based on, what, as I said, the nutritional knowledge of the 1980s. So they took 80 milligrams of zinc oxide. This is really a pretty high dose um, and not a very bioavailable form of zinc, but that's what they chose. This dose of zinc is so high that it can cause anemia, that, and that's why they added, had to add two milligrams of copper oxide uh, to prevent the anemia that would be caused. They had a reasonable moderate dose of 500 milligrams of vitamin C and 400 international units of vitamin E, and they, had, they chose a very high dose of beta carotene. Uh, 15 milligrams per day, which is 25,000 international units. They did this, um, you know, beta carotene is not, even though it's not found high in the eye, it's metabolites, it's broken down to, retino to retinoids, so it was a reasonable choice for this. But in retrospect, they found this was too high a, too high a level to be, to be uh, using. But this was available at the time in 1980s, was available in, uh, in large quantities. And they followed these patients for uh, five to seven years, and they found actually to a lot of clinicians' surprise that the antioxidant intervention really did make a difference. Shown here is the placebo line here for risk of progression to severe vision loss, and the patients who were randomized to the combination of antioxidants and zinc did the best. There was a reduction of about 25 percent of the rate of progression over the five to seven years here, and it was less if you took just antioxidants or zinc itself. And this is uh, real, but it's relatively modest. But when you think about a disease that potentially affects millions of people, this 25% uh, this risk reduction really is important. And that's why it was rapidly uh, translated into clinical practice and recommendations. And this was not due to progression of cataract, at least in the United States population. There was no difference between patients getting placebo or not. And it was all driven by primarily risk of developing advanced age-related macular degeneration, either geographic atrophy or uh, choroidal neovascularization. And again, it was the same, the patients did best if they were on antioxidants and zinc. So the summary of what AREDS-1 taught us is that there could be a, uh, that inter dietary intervention or nutritional supplement intervention could cause, could result in a significant reduction in progression of age-related macular degeneration at least in the high-risk people. It's harder to, t to translate the, a the AREDS pop uh, recommendation, again, to the worried well, the patients who are, have a family history who are 40 or 50 years old. We, t at least I still tend to recommend diet rather than taking high-dose supplements in those patients. Uh, this did not seem to have much reduction in cataract progression, but clearly this is just the first generation uh, supplementation. It's kind of like chemotherapy in the 1950s. You know, you could prolong life a little bit, but if you really want to get a significant, um, a really substantial life impacting change, you're going to have to look at different combinations. You're going to have to try to improve upon the formulation. So specifically in the original publication in 2001, they did mention that lutein and zeaxanthin, and some of the more, and, and also omega-3 fatty acids, the newer uh, nutritional knowledge needed to be applied and uh, looked at in, in optimizing the formulation. So AREDS-2 was initiated about three or four years ago, and we're one of the AREDS-2 sites. And they have a, we're now studying a new generation formulation where we're, where we're adding fish oil, and I'll talk a little bit more in some future slides how this was come up, how they came up with 1,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA. 
and they added lutein at 10 milligrams and zeaxanthin at 2 milligrams. And they also realized that they needed to decrease the levels of zinc because they were having urinary tract problems in some of the patients. And they also needed to reduce the levels of beta carotene. Not only might it interfere with uptake of lutein and zeaxanthin, but the doses were so high that it was contraindicated in smokers. Uh, it was found during the AREDS-1 study that a number of pa uh, publications came out that that high dose of beta carotene increases the risk of cancer in smokers. And, and although not here in Utah, many, many AMD patients are smokers, so you're, that's not the way you want to go. Uh, right now we're studying, there are 4,000 patients that are more than halfway through the five-year uh, process at 100 sites. They're all in their age range of 50 to 80, and they have high-risk dry age-related macular degeneration. Um, and recruitment is com complete, but we still have a number of patients going through. So I can't comment yet on what AREDS-2 is going to show us. It's not going to be published until 2013 is probably when we will have the results. Um, but certainly they pick a fairly high-risk population. We're getting plenty of progression of the disease in, in, our, po in our patients, either to choroidal neovascularization and, uh, or geographic atrophy. So uh, they did choose a good population to study from, an FD, from a clinical trials standpoint. So why did they put in fish oil? Well, multiple epidemiology studies have shown, we're starting to show through the years that consumption of fish, particular, uh, in particular fatty fish such as salmon and tuna, uh, had, were associated with protection against age-related macular degeneration. Typically, we're talking about reasonable consumptions, two or three servings per week, uh, which for many, many patients, there are plenty of patients that don't eat fish at all, but uh, they found that uh, the consumption of that level seemed to be associated in, in epidemiology with decreased risk of age-related macular degeneration. And physiologically, it meets, it meets the criteria. It's found these omega-3 fatty acids like EPA or especially DHA constitute up to 30, per, 30 to 40 percent of the photoreceptor, the lipids in the photoreceptor membranes. So they're found in high amounts. Low levels of this, uh, we recently published a paper uh, looking at autopsy eyes of, uh, of AMD patients versus age match controls, and there is about a 30, 20 to 30% reduction in omega-3 fatty acid levels in patients with, uh, with early AMD in the, in the autopsy eyes. And it's also been shown protective, as we, as we mentioned before, in a, in a reasonable model for dry macular degeneration, Stargard 3. And also, as a, as a nutritional intervention, it is safe and well-tolerated. Omega-3 fish is, uh, does not have side effects as far as we have too many side effects to people. And the omega-3 fatty acids that you can get in pill form at the 1,000 milligram level are pretty safe. As the, the main problem is that patients don't like the fishy taste that they sometimes get. But in terms of bleeding, other problems, there is, there, it's a very safe dose. The high doses that cardiovascular uh, uh, physicians use up to, up to three grams per day can cause bleeding problems, but it's, uh, the, it's not found at the 1,000 milligram level. Um, and we, in my laboratory, are studying a lot of the metabolites, these very long chain uh, fatty acids that are metabolites, but I don't have time today to cover that. We're going to be focusing primarily on the xanthophils, the carotenoids of the macular pigment. So. I've been studying the macular pigment now for 15 or 20 years. I think that the macular pigment is the yellow pigmentation right at the fovea. And this is a cross section, a classic cross section of a monkey fovea showing that's unstained, just showing how yellow the macula is. And for those of you who know some history or Latin, the macula actually stands for the macula lutea or the yellow spot. This has been known going back to the 1700s that the macula of the primate eye is very different, very unusual. It has this yellow spot. And one of the reasons I got into the macular pigment field is looking at this and wondering biochemically how and why this is occurring. Why is this so important? And why does the body go, the human and uh, body go out of its way to concentrate these carotenoids that are found in specific uh, fruits and vegetables uh, that we consume? They're concentrated directly into the macula of the eye. And this is found essentially in every eye, except in very, very unusual situations. And all of the lutein and zeaxanthin that's found here 
has to come from our diet. We cannot make it. We're not like plants that can synthesize lutein and zeaxanthin. We can't even make it from closely related carotenoids such as beta carotene. Um, it all has to come from the diet. And there has been uh, multiple lines of evidence that indicate from epidemiology that, they're that they may be protective against age-related macular degeneration. And there's even some new information coming through that they may be important in infant macular development. And we're doing some studies on that. So the knowledge of the, age of the importance of lutein and zeaxanthin came out during my fellowship from the eye disease case control study in uh, 1993 and 94. And they found there was a highly significant inverse correlation between the levels of serum carotenoid levels and risk of age-related macular degeneration. And when they did a when Joanna Sudden at Mass Eye and Ear did a subsequent analysis, she found that dietary consumption, specifically of green leafy vegetables, high in lutein and zeaxanthin, looking at this same population, were associated with a lower risk of age-related macular degeneration. Um, this is an important one. This shows the how epidemiology may be important, but it, no one really had ever looked to see if ocular levels of carotenoids are associated with this. And um, we developed, just to kind of summarize some work that we did, we've been, and a number of other people have, a number of other centers have developed ways of actually measuring ocular carotenoid levels in patients uh, non-invasively, so we don't have to take their eyes out and do HPLC on them. And there is uh, growing, growing uh, information and growing body of knowledge that ocular carotenoid levels, low levels are associated with higher risk of progression to age-related macular degeneration. Higher levels seem to be protective. And so we do offer as a test, that, as, a, not, as a, um, a no charge test in my clinic, various ways of measuring ocular carotenoid levels to see if they can, uh, and to see if that, uh, to give feedback to our patients whether they're getting enough lutein and zeaxanthin. But I'm going to be concentrating today mainly more on biochemistry in the eye and the carotenoids. Well, why are carotenoids important? We've already learned they're found, found at high levels in the eye. There's good epidemiology to show they should be studied. What do we know about some of the basic biochemistry? Well, carotenoids are yellow compounds, like shown in these yellow peppers here. And so they absorb blue light very, very well. They're yellow filters. And they're found in the inner retina before the light hits the, most, the more sensitive photoreceptors. So they're, ideal, they're ideally placed to act as an optical filter in the eye. There are some animal studies that are uh, on monkeys raised in Oregon on carotenoid-free diets that uh, have just been recently published that, that show that they are more susceptible to light damage. Also, they are starting, so these animals who have been on carotenoid-free diets for, I think now, 20, 15 to 20 years are beginning to show signs of geographic atrophy. So they are starting to show signs. Not only do they get drusen, but they're also starting to, at an earlier age, they're starting to show at least some signs reminiscent of dry age-related macular degeneration. Um, we know that the carotenoids in the eye can be manipulated by diet and by supplementation. This is a process that, however, is very, very slow. They, um, this, uh, to change the levels in macular pigment, you have to take the supplements probably for many, many months, if not a year or two, to see, sp to see significant changes within the eye. And to cause depletion, as they've done in monkeys, you probably have to put someone on a carotenoid deficient diet for several years. Um, biochemically, they are antioxidants. And as we've talked before, the retina is exposed to high levels of light and oxygen that can generate free radicals. And this can damage photoreceptor membrane, membranes. In vitro, they're very efficient quenchers of singlet oxygen and related free radicals. But they're in the inner retina, which is really not the area we think is the highest levels of oxidative stress. So this is still a controversial theory in the field. Um, I mentioned before that uh, carotenoid intake and macular pigment seem to be associated with risk of macular degeneration and can be manipulated. Uh, my colleagues in Florida, Richard Bone and John Landrum, did human autopsy studies looking at a AMD eyes and age-matched eyes and found that there's about a 30% lower level of macular pigment in eyes with age-related macular degeneration. And we confirmed this looking at relatively early stage patients using resonance Raman spectroscopy, that again, this 30% level is very consistently found in patients before the lutein supplementation era. It's getting very hard to do this now that so many of our patients are taking supplements already. Um, these, we already discussed about uh, supplementation 
and the macaque studies. So what do we do in my laboratory uh, with carotenoids? Well, we're involved in the AREDS-2 study. So we're on the clinical side over here in this building where we have about 60 patients involved in the AREDS-2 study. We have a sub-study where we are doing macular pigment measurements over in Research Park uh, to follow these patients and we do blood level, levels, blood level measurements by HPLC in my laboratory. And in association, in association with the physics department, we've been developing non-invasive methods to measure macular carotenoid levels both in the eye and in the skin. Um, but the focus that I'm going to talk about today is on pure biochemistry. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we have identified and characterized how carotenoids even get into the eye. So the, and this involves binding proteins. And from this, from the basic biochemistry, we hope to uniquely offer uh, insights into the mechanisms of how carotenoids may protect against age-related macular degeneration. So I think we're doing good on time. So going more into the, the basic uh, biochemistry side, we've talked about carotenoids. Well, carotenoids are the plant pigments in, that are universally found uh, in nature. And there's somewhere, depending on how you count them, there's at least 600 different carotenoids in nature. Probably the number is closer to 850 is what, is what we really know. But we don't eat everything that there is out there. So we consume about 50 carotenoids in our diet. And again, these are the ones that are responsible for a lot of the coloration of all of the fruits and vegetables that we eat. Not everything is shown here, but an awful lot of it. So we consume about 50 of these, but there's a level of specificity of these 50, only about 20 of them actually make it into our serum and are, dete and are detectable if I did a blood sample on you. And of these 20 carotenoids that we consume, only two, lutein and zeaxanthin, found in the eye. And these aren't even the ones that are found in the highest amounts in our, in our bloodstream. The highest amounts are things like beta-cryptoxanthin, beta-carotene, and lycopene are the ones that are found in highest amounts. So clearly, there's a level of selection to bring these compounds into the retina. And even within the macula, it's, or within the retina itself, there's even more specificity. So the macular pigment right here in the fovea is a mixture of three of these different compounds here, some of which are from the diet and some of which are metabolites. So we see lutein there. We see its metabolite, three prime epilutein. We see zeaxanthin, which is the other one that we get from our diet. Now we consume in an American diet about two milligrams of lutein uh, per day, per person. Zeaxanthin is much less common. We consume about 0.2 milligrams per day. But very unusually, there's a lot of mesozeaxanthin, which we never consume in our diet, unless you have a diet high in fish scales and, uh, that's, and, shrimp, and shrimp shells are good sources of these. So most of us don't consume this. But in the eye, right in the fovea, there's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio of lutein to zeaxanthin to mesozeaxanthin. So there's actually metabolism, and we and others have shown that lutein is the precursor for mesozeaxanthin. And then there's some oxidized compounds here. But the concentration is very high. It's greater than one millimolar, which is pretty high for a biological compound in a tissue. But if you move just a couple millimeters away, just, to, you know, just a little ways into the peripheral macula, the concentration will drop by a hundredfold. And the ratios change. So in the blood and liver, our levels are lutein is 3 to 1 to 0 for lutein to zeaxanthin to mesozeaxanthin. In peripheral retina, there's kind of an intermediate one, but in the macula, it's 1 to 1 to 1. So anytime there's a specificity, exquisite biochemical specificity such as this, it's usually mediated by some sort of protein because proteins have, uh, are well known to bind hydrophobic molecules like lutein and zeaxanthin, and uh, they provide specificity to actually select out the carotenoids that are important. And these have been very well characterized, in, in the carotenoid and xanthophyll binding proteins have been very well characterized in plants, microorganisms, and invertebrates. The most famous one is the one called crustocyanin, which is the responsible for the color of a lobster's shell. And this binds astaxanthin, a different carotenoid that some people take for AMD but is not found in the eye. And that gives their characteristic color here. If you boil your lobster, you denature the protein, it releases the carotenoid, and that's why you see their color change to the bright red here. But what kind of proteins are available to humans? Well, when I started working this, 
All that was known is that high-density lipoprotein, LDL, albumin, and beta-lactoglobulin are involved in mammalian carotenoid transport. It was known that they were the carriers within the bloodstream. But there was absolutely nothing known about carotenoid binding, binding proteins in the eye. And what could these be doing? Well, certainly the most important hypothesis that we're working on is that they could be involved in the selective uptake and concentration of lutein and zeaxanthin into the macula. And once they're into the macula, they're very, very stable. The macular pigment in an autopsy eye stays where it is. It doesn't diffuse away. It, uh, if you put a person on a carotenoid-restricted diet, it will take years for them to, get, uh, to, to lose their carotenoids. So they're very, very stable in the, wherever they are, in the cytosol, the cell membrane, or in the cytoskeleton. They could be important uh, enzymes in, involved in the interconversion of lutein to mesozeaxanthin. So that's something we're still looking for. And they may facilitate the antioxidant and photoprotective act, uh, action of these carotenoids. So um, we spent five to 10 years trying to find a protein that in the eye that was responsible for the uptake of, lut of lutein or zeaxanthin into the eye. And I, I'll s our first important paper came out on this, or the, the most important paper, was the first, the identification of GSTP1 as the zeaxanthin binding protein in the macula of the human eye. This was truly brute force biochemistry. We got hundreds and hundreds of uh, maculas from the eye bank here. We would grind them up, run them on columns, and follow the carotenoids and follow which proteins were involved, were associated with these carotenoids before we could identify that GSTP1, a somewhat in unexpected protein, was the zeaxanthin binding protein. And to just summarize quite a few years of work, I'll just show you some of the important things that we found is not only was GSTP1 purified from the eye associated with the zeaxanthin, but it actually did bind zeaxanthin at, at high levels. And shown here are classical binding experiments where we would take um, zeaxanthin and purified GSTP1, we'd incubate it with this and look at how much would specifically bind and compare that to other proteins that had been theorized to uh, interact with uh, zeaxanthin, things like tubulin, albumin, and a lot of the serum carriers. And we could see that very reproducibly, zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin had a high affinity for GSTP1 in the, uh, the sub-micromolar range. And that lutein, on the other hand, which is shown here with the black boxes here, uh, had, w did not bind to GSTP1. So there was selectivity even between zeaxanthin and lutein in the eye uh, in, with this protein. And then, of course, you have to be able to show that it's in the right tissues. And we t uh, took an antibody to GSTP1, and we used it to stain a monkey retina here right in the fovea. It's uh, because of different fixation. It doesn't look quite as pretty as uh, Max Snodderley's localization of where the carotenoids are, the yellow pigmentation. But we could see, as expected, that the zeaxanthin binding protein, the GSTP1, was concentrated in the Henle fiber layer right in the foveal pit and was more highly expressed in the fovea than in the peripheral retina. So we solved uh, uh, one problem. We now know at least some way that zeaxanthin was getting into the eye. The question was, what is the lutein binding protein? And we could do our same brute force biochemistry and show that there was a protein present in the, in the, in the human macula that could specifically bind lutein, shown here. But we ran into a brick wall. We could not identify this protein. We would get a reasonably pure preparation and then we would send it off for sequencing and we would get back garbage sequences that didn't, of proteins that didn't bind lutein. So how were we gonna solve this? Well, I had to get creative. And uh, I was at a meeting on the International Carotenoid Society, which is not, a, uh, not an eye meeting at all, but it's a gathering uh, that happens every three years of 350 carotenoid scientists. So it's botanists, plant physiologists, everyone anyone who studies carotenoids, and it, we're hoping to have this meeting here in Utah in 2014. But I ran into someone, to a plant, to a, an insect physiologist who was studying lutein binding proteins in silkworms. So silkworms eat a lot of mulberry leaves, which are high in lutein, and this is shown their larvae here, and they spin their cocoons. And it's well known to the Japanese that you could have different strains of these, uh, of these uh, silkworms. Some would make white cocoons, some would make yellow cocoons. And it was known that the yellow cocoons were, uh, were rich in lutein. The coloration was covering, coming from the lutein there. And 
there was, the genetics was all worked out and they knew that there were certain mutations and, which, uh, and it was found that a protein called CVP is responsible for the uptake of lutein from the gut and delivery to the silk gland. And CVP is a STAR-D lutein binding protein. STAR-D stands for steroidogenic acute regulatory domain protein. So just on a hunch I said, well, you know, obviously even though silkworms and humans don't share a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of structural or any other similarities, but they do have this interest in accumulating lutein, would is that somehow could this give us a clue as to what the lutein binding protein is? So uh, my colleague in Japan gave us an antibody and we applied it both to our purified lutein binding protein preparations and also applied it to monkey and human retinas. And sure enough, this antibody to a silkworm, to a silkworm protein specifically labeled not the inner segments right where we would expect of the inner segments of the photoreceptors and even some labeling down into the Henle fiber layer here. So this was pretty remarkable and gave us a lot of clues of what we should be looking at that hopefully our protein might be a Stardy protein. But the problem is there are many Stardy proteins in the human genome. There are exactly 15. So we had to sort out which of these 15 might be the important one because we weren't getting good sequence data on this. And shown here is just uh, from a review article just showing the different classifications that STAR-D1 and STAR-D3 uh, were the ones that uh, are one family and you can see the other families here. So we looked at, we did uh, computer modeling first and just did a, an in, an, a query using CVP, the silkworm protein, to see which of the 15 STAR-D proteins in the human genome are, are closely related to it. And it came out that it showed that we had to focus primarily on STAR-D1 and STAR-D3, which do show remarkable homology. It's 30% uh, homology between the silkworm protein and the human protein, which is really pretty good considering how separated the two, the two organisms are. And we then did West, we obtained antibodies to all 15 of these STAR-D proteins, and that's shown here, and looked to see which ones were found in human tissue, which ones were found in mouse retinal tissue, and also we did some positive controls with liver. And we found that STAR-D1 and STAR-D3 were good candidates, but STAR-D1 was rapidly dropping out as one that we wanted to pursue. It's not found anywhere in anyone's retina. It's not even found in the liver. Actually, STAR-D1 is found primarily in adrenal gland, and also very interestingly for some of our future work, it's found in a different carotenoid-rich tissue. So what other tissue does anyone want to chime in is the most carotenoid-rich the, besides the eye in humans? Nope, skin's not, not the most. Corpus luteum, the yellow, the corpus luteum of the ovary is the most carotenoid rich and that's, and that's where STAR-D1 is. And so we've established a collaboration now with the OBGYN department to look at the role of STAR-D1 perhaps in human fertility. But STAR-D3 was looking pretty good. It's found very heavily expressed in the human macula, less in the human peripheral retina. Um, and also in the RPE. And the only other STAR-D protein that's found in there is STAR-D8. Now, STAR-D proteins are in, uh, bind small hydrophobic ligands, so this, is, this was all looking pretty good that we needed to focus on this. So we obtained, and this is just showing the Western blot, showing uh, the an, 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 a different antibody using against STAR-D3 that's more specific. You can see a strong labeling of STAR-D3 right in the human macula. Uh, normalized uh, human peripheral retina has, almost, has very little, although it is detectable. And very interestingly, the mouse, I told you, they can't pick up carotenoids. They don't express STAR-D3 in their retina here. And again, we could confirm this also, it's a little bit out of line here, that uh, STAR-D3 is expressed by RT-PCR. So is it found in the retina? And this is some beautiful work done by Gene Frederick here um, in our department where we labeled the cones, just all cones in green, to see what everything is. is. But we used the antibody to STAR-D3, shown here in red, and you can see that it labels very nicely the cone inner segments and into the Henle fiber layer, right in a monkey fovea here. There's a little bit of nonspecific staining of the RPE because you can see if we preabsorb using the STAR-D3 protein to get it to, we, we lose all of the staining as you would expect in the inner segments where this protein is. There's a little bit of autofluorescence of the pigment epithelium. So it's localized in the right area. 
And shown here is a little is a more classic study here where you can see the red right in the foveal pit that matches up re really quite well with the distribution. So the question is, does, it, does STAR D3 actually bind the carotenoids? Well, I told you we did work before doing brute force biochemistry where we would take the protein, incubate it overnight, extract all of these, it was, and it took a long time to do all of those binding studies. But we've upgraded to the modern age now, and we did now use a method called surface plasmon resonance, and we have a device here, although we've upgraded again. And on this, you put your protein if you have, as long as you have a pure protein, you put it on a, on a gold chip right here, and you then pass through a microcapillary, your ligand, the solubilized carotenoid, and when it binds to the protein right on the chip, you get a change in refractive index that's very sensitively measured here. And so we can look at binding now, instead of looking at equilibrium binding overnight, we can look at the actual time course of binding and release of the compounds. And shown here is, a, uh, is what's called a sensorgram, using GSTP-1 on the chip, where you can see as we increase the concentration of carotenoids, we can see a progressive change, saturated change of response in these protein, in the, when zeaxanthin binds, when mesozeaxanthin binds. But then when you put lutein on there, all you get is noise. Lute it, this protein is exquisitely, sens uh, exquisitely selective for, for zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin. And we obtained a uh, good quality star D3 from, uh, that we expressed in our, in, uh, in our laboratory, and we did the binding protein studies. And this just summarizes the differences between binding. Basically, you want very low, the lower the number, the better. That shows specific binding. And you want to see some sort of specificity bet in distinguishing between carotenoids. So human serum albumin, which is a nonspecific binder, doesn't bind. Uh, doesn't have very high affinity binding. You don't see anything below 0.5 micromolar, and it doesn't select between any of the carotenoids here. The silkworm binding protein, on the other hand, can select out lutein and has a pretty high affinity at 0.18. Uh, GSTP1 is exquisitely uh, selective for zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin, but doesn't care about these other carotenoids. And STAR-D3 itself, although not quite as good as CBP, does show that it is selective for lutein compared to all the other carotenoids, at least at a reasonable level. So basically, we've been able to show, and we're just about, we're hopefully going to publish this within the next month, where it's in the revision stage right now, that STAR D3 fulfills the three essential criteria to, to be the macula's lutein uh, binding protein. It's, ma it's macula enhanced on Western blots. Its immunohistochemistry puts it right into the right layer, right areas, and it selectively binds lutein with high affinity. So in summary, uh, we've shown that there's specific saturable xanthophyll binding proteins are present in the human macula. They're in the right area. GSTP1 is the zeaxanthin binding protein, and uh, STAR-D3 is the lutein binding protein. And very interestingly, we've been able to show a whole new class of proteins. The STAR-D proteins play a prominent and recurring role in, as lutein binding proteins in a wide variety of organisms ranging from silkworms to humans. And so next, we're beginning to start to look at what is the role both genetically and physiologically in these, uh, in the, of these proteins in AMD and risk progression, and that's for future studies. So uh, to just end up with, I'll talk briefly, very briefly, about herbal medicines and age-related macular degeneration, which is certainly a frontier out there. But there is the problem, of course, is that objective evidence is generally lacking. And, um, but our patients come in and talk about at least some of the more popular herbals like bilberry, red wine, eyebright, and goji berries. So what do we know about bilberry? Well, bilberry has been promoted to enhance dark adaptation and treat age-related macular degeneration. They're not carotenoids. They're anthocyanidin flavonoids, and shown here as an example here. Uh, there's been anecdotal reports that the Royal Air Force pilots in World War II ate lots of bilberry, and that's why they could see so well at night. Uh, they also they didn't happen to mention that they also had radar, which helped them quite a bit at night, too. <laughs> and that was, uh, the bilberry is thought to actually to have been a cover-up so that they didn't have to talk about the radar that they actually had. Um, there's still no good prospective studies yet that we can advise our patients that it's, that it's useful in AMD, but it's certainly being studied. It's not found in very high amounts in the retina. Uh, resveratrol, shown here in red wine, I mentioned that epidemiology shows that there's Somewhat lowers of a, lower levels of AMD in red wine drinkers, um, but 
this is some, the doses that are being given are very high, but people are looking at this in future, in, uh, in epidemi, in prospective studies, I think, right now. Ibright is another one that patients may mention. Uh, it's uh, promoted for both surface and uh, retina disease. Uh, it can be used in compresses or teas or tea. There's no objective me mechanism I can find except for the fact that it's got a good name for marketing. And then finally, you do have to remember gochi berries, which are uh, found in the, which have been known, I think, for centuries in the Chinese traditional medicine, have been long promoted for eye disorder. And this, also known as wolfberry, is usually consumed as dried fruit or tea. But this one actually does make sense. It's extraordinarily rich in zeaxanthin. In fact, it's a commercial source of zeaxanthin in some, in some areas. So this one, you can see that traditional medicine did get it right, that this one probably has, uh, could be important for eye disease. So to sum up, what do we tell our patients now? What's the state of knowledge? Still, when I talk with my patients, I tell them to eat a healthy diet with lots of fruits and vegetables and fish and no excessive fat. I, uh, in patients who are at high risk of progression, they need to consider an ARED supplement. Plus, I, um, I'm not willing to wait for the results of AREDS too. I, I feel comfortable recommending lutein and zeaxanthin at these doses, the six to 10 milligram lutein dose and two milligrams of zeaxanthin. Fish oil, uh, there's not as strong an evidence, but is uh, certainly reasonable to take. I have to tell the patients to wait on single nutrient uh, supplements until there's more data. Alcohol may be important, but obviously should only be used in moderation. No, uh, smoking is very bad and avoid excessive light exposure. And I certainly support, uh, support and uh, s thank our AREDS2 participants who are help, will help give us definitive answers for our patients. And I, of course, want to thank the people of my laboratory and my various collaborators and the Moran Eye Center. Thank you. Question or two? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, which is this AMD deficient in the Ah, that's a good question. We do not know that yet. Um, we, that's a little more difficult to measure the levels of the binding proteins, at least on autopsy eyes. I mean, we can't do it non-invasively, but we're beginning to look at the expression of this. It's a whole, it, it, it's a difficult problem. That's going to be probably the, the, the goal of my next grant to figure this out. Yes. Okay, actually, you were next. You know, mainly it has to do with their antioxidant effect, as far as we know. Degradation of carotenoids does happen, but it's relatively, they're pretty stable, especially when they're bound to proteins. So most of their antioxidant effect does not involve degradation. It's a reversible, uh, it's a reversible cycle process. And even the oxidized carotenoids that we find can probably be reduced back to their, uh, by some sort of antioxidant, uh, by some sort of cycle. So as far as we know, uh, in terms of inflammation and, uh, you know, that it probably has to do with oxidative stress, at least as far as we know. Okay. And Emmy? So, um, is the binding protein only found in fish? And I'm trying to figure out how yeah. the carotenoids get so ah. adherent to the oxygen. Yeah, I didn't even talk about that. That's a whole other, whole other area. So on the serum, they're thought to be on HDL and LDL. They're, to transport into the cell, the thought is that scavenger receptor uh, class, the SRV1 and CD36, are being are somehow involved, at least in, in cell culture studies. They seem to promote uptake of carotenoids. C, um, SRV1 is not found in the right, is found in the pigment epithelium, but not in the retina in the right cell, so it may be CD36. But that's a whole other area. We're just barely getting involved in that area, so I didn't want to talk about that right now. But clearly, we found just one part of, we're solving parts of the puzzle. It's going to take more to, to figure it all out. Yes? What's your opinion of the blue light blocking the glass of the lens? So with the, the question is, what about the blue light, the yellow lenses that we put in? It's, it makes some physiological sense that they may be important. The, the yellow pigmentation, at least, in the, of the macula is acting as a screening compound. There are a few other animals, uh, for example, the, if you look at squirrels, they don't have, they have a very cone-rich retina. They don't have carotenoids, but they 
have yellow lenses from kynuranic acid. So physiologically, it makes sense. The thing that I'm disappointed in is that uh, it, you know, Alcon and all the others went to marketing so quickly and never really did. There's not been very good studies to show that they actually do make a difference. There's some studies that are coming out of Japan that are showing and more kind of intriguingly that patients who get, when they compare clear lenses to yellow lenses, have a drop in their macular pigment level if they have the clear lenses. So there may be something going on in the macula itself that's long-term causing either degradation or low levels of macular pigment. So my feeling is it's intriguing, but it's not proven. But they were able to get it through without, uh, without the proof. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. What's new? We together in May next week to uh, okay. meet Alan and Bob. Okay. Uh, we to hire somebody to improve mm -hmm. and have it driven by us rather than by the What is this? Okay.